Some, though, were wide as a stair, some wider than a road, some curved like thunder, some were straight like the sea's tides. Still others were thin like the breath of a June dew, and a few I saw waved like heat off an August noon. But all, as far as I could tell, had the same type of blade, milky white, glossy, and cold like a fog creeping low across a morning before a funeral. In fact, so curious was I about their composition, I reached out to touch one. And if not for a sharp click and a wild fluttering of his violet eyelashes, I would have succeeded. They cut every time, warned the man with no arms, every time. Smartly, I withdrew. Here, he blinked quickly at a blade at least four feet long, tapering to a blunt tip. This one took me three winters to make. It kills the taste of salt. The one next to it kills the smell of wild lupine, blackberry lily, and lush evening primrose. There, turning to a fat blade suspended in the buzzing gray, that one kills the color green. And the man with no arms grinned, because he already knew the darkness I guarded, and with violent lash flutterings turned away from those tiny cuts and led me on to those deeper cuts, blinking in and out of the strange, shift-thickening haze. Here only a few swords floated. These ones take lives, his violet lashes battered, but unlike the smaller ones and the fat ones, they all appeared to be the same, sleek and long, and bowed like a theft. Ah, but they're not the same. Closest to you is a 10-year sword. That one's a 25-year sword. A hundred above it, and there, a 287-year sword. And this one, I ask, tentatively reaching out for the handle, until unchecked, I actually took hold of it. That's your 50-year sword, he said oddly. You almost can't see the blade, I added, marveling at the way the weapon bit through the air, the way the finely carved handle bound in a fine fall braid and beaded with winks of pale pearl seemed with every swipe to melt into my palm. Oh, the man with no arms chuckled, you can never see the blade. When I would not, which I would not understand until I'd returned and found my blade had dissolved into breezes and hours. But will it kill, I wanted to know, dimly resenting him now that my sword hung once again in that flickering deep. In half a century, from birth to the final second of the 50th year, every time, most of the time. This surprised me. Why most? No weapon is perfect. Whatever this blade passes through, it most certainly will divide. Though there is one thing which can stitch and hold the wound. What's that? Ah, your heart is blacker than will ever be told. But that is why you're here. Beyond him, then, I caught sight of still more swords, though these were inconceivably long. For you, maybe, said the man with no arms. For me, they are as they are, some a mile long, some a river long. There is one that is a sky long. They kill lives, too? I suppose. One sword will kill a season. One will kill a country. One I'm making now will even kill an idea. An idea, I pondered. But those are too expensive for you, and his violet lashes seem to tremble with delight. How much, I pressed. The wielder must die before wielding it. But, I objected, yes, it's tricky. Too tricky for you, as I already said. Too expensive. Then the man with no arms led me back among the tiny and wavering swords. These cost a breath you may never take again. Those a feeling you may never shape again. Then his lashes quivered daintily. Beware, though, as all are double-edged and come with this warning. Should a wound ever fail, you will vanish like the blade you wield. But I didn't care. What about the 50-year sword? Your sword, 
his violet lashes twitching slyly. I could not object. I knew, too, it was my sword. I knew when the handle melted beneath my fingers and the blade shivered familiarly along my arm and into my past. Yes, how much is my sword? A memory you have which would have outlived you. And before I had even finished saying agreed, the man with no arms somehow already held clenched between his teeth the handle of a sword with a blade which swayed like a long blade of evening grass. Just as quickly, too, he slid behind me, and I felt a sting between my shoulder blades, and then a fire and a cold, and a sudden something seep of hurt. And then my eyes dried up, and they also hurt. There, blinked the man with no arms, happily showing me what was now separate, suspended carefully in the air, a single harvester with dark orange wings, struck through with light and dapples of bruised dark. What is it? I wanted to know. But his violet lashes flickered, as if now to say, no. And he boxed up my fifty-year sword and never said more. And so I descended the mountain of any one paths, crossing back through the forest of note, before finally making my way away from the valley of salt. And only in the years to come would I realize what he had taken. My heart stayed just as black and my badness spread more easily. But the memory and reason behind such blackness and badness had vanished completely. Which is my story. There is no more. And even if the storyteller had indeed cut himself short, which it seemed to Chintana he had, he gave no indacitation, only hunching his shoulders and lowering his eyes with a sigh a sight so soaked with sadness, even the orphans responded to it. Chintana knew better, though. She listened instead to her chest, which guarded a much more subtle ear, and she accepted the sharpening shrill of her thumb. For even as the social worker snored now in a recliner, and the storyteller seemed to recomport himself into an even smaller stillness, Chintana knew what the orphans were about to ask, which somehow meant she also knew he too knew what they would ask and how he would answer. In fact, the only thing Chintana did not know was how she herself would respond. At least get up, she tried to tell herself. But though already on the edge of her seat, as if in a poison of a dream, she felt unable to move even an itsy bit. Tarf grunted then, refusing, unable to look away from the long box with its angles of black, and so asked, Is that the sword? And of course, all five windows were open now, and the wind and falling clouds split apart with falling hail, ripped into the room, and the five flames on five wicks on five candles of molasses, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, and ginger shook and faltered. But no one there could heed the candles anymore or understand the shadows or hear the notes or follow the paths. Not even Chintana, who, try as she might, could not wrench herself free. And so Tarf did as he was told, lifting the first latch. And so Izaid did as he was told, lifting the second latch. And so Anidia did as she was told, lifting the third latch. And so Sithis did as he was told, lifting the the fourth latch, and so Micket did as she was told, lifting the last latch, and then all withdrew as the storyteller leaned forward and lifted the lid. Good evening. It was 40 years ago today that a famous singer-songwriter played Carnegie Hall and began his concert with the words, it's Halloween and I got my Bob Dylan mask on. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it's Halloween, and Mark Z. Danielewski's got his Mark Z. Danielewski mask on, as you have just seen. Welcome to a hallowed evening about and around Mark Danielewski's new ghost story, The Fifty Years Sort, a small poetic novella that has his world, its world premiere in two versions, English and Dutch, in Holland. The Fifty Years Sort is a story that takes place on Halloween and which takes us to a party where a strange guest turns up, a man who calls himself a bad man with a very black heart, a storyteller who recounts his search for a magic weapon, a search which leads him through the Valley of Salt, the Forest of Note, and the Mountain of Many a One Paths. There he meets a man with no arms, who gives him a 50-year sword, and of course we get to see what happens when the sword is used. The Fifty Year Sword is a book with a strange form, not only because the text is set in small columns or because there are illustrations and white pages, but also because there are five voices to tell the story. Five voices which get different colors in the book, in quotation marks. Strange form is Mark Danielewski's trademark. Let me take my mind back to the year 2000, when there landed on my desk a book which turned out to be one of the strangest I've ever read, House of Leaves, a symphony of voices that one could describe as a postmodern horror story, the story of a photographer who moves with his family to a haunted house, haunted not in the classical sense of the word, but haunted because the house turns out to have more than three dimensions. A strange story, in the first place because of how it was told. As a popular scientific commentary on the videos, the photographer shoots in the house, told in different voices. But also a strange story because of how it was put on the page. This remarkable book, which worked with different typographies, with different type pages, and even with different colors on the pages, was the debut of Mark Danielewski from Los Angeles, born in 1966. The son of a film director and the brother of a singer-songwriter who is called Poe, after the father of horror fiction and doubtlessly one of Mark Danielewski's great influences. House of Leaves, in Dutch, Het Kaartenhuis, was a great success, also in translation, and was followed by the Willstow letters, letters from the asylum written by the mother of the most important character in House of Leaves, Johnny Truand. And this was not the only spin-off of House of Leaves. Mark Z. Danielewski branched out to the internet to the making of films, and even to the making of music, as we will see and hear in a few moments. You could say that Mark Z. Danielewski is like the House of Leaves he described. He's got four dimensions, or to say it in terms of this evening, he's got many masks. suggested we go for a drive in her new two-door BMW coupe. In the parking lot, we slipped into her bucket seats. Kiri took over from there. 
At nearly 90 miles per hour, she zipped us up to that windy edge known to some as Mulholland, a sinuous road running the ridge of the Santa Monica Mountains, where she then proceeded to pump her vehicle in and out of turns, sometimes dropping down to 50 miles per hour, only to immediately gun it back up to 90 again. Fast, slow, fast, fast, slow. Sometimes a wide turn, sometimes a quick one. She preferred the tighter ones, the sharp, controlled jerk, swinging left to right before driving back to the right, only so she could do it all over again, until after enough speed and enough wind and more distance than I'd been prepared to expect, taking me to parts of the city I rarely think of and never visit, I heard her say, I can't remember the inane things I started babbling about then. I know it didn't really matter. She wasn't listening. She just yanked up on the emergency brake, dropped her seat back, and told me to lie on top of her. On top of those leather pants of hers, her hands immediately guiding mine over those soft, slightly oily folds, positioning my fingers on the shiny metal tabs, small and round like a tear, then murmuring a murmur so inaudible that even though I could feel her lips tremble against my ear, she seemed far, far away. Pinch it, she said, which I did, lightly, until she also said pull it, which I also did, gently parting the teeth, one at a time, down under and beneath, the longest unzipping of my life. We never even kissed or looked into each other's eyes. Our lips just trespassed on those inner labyrinths hidden deep within our ears, filled them with the private music of wicked words, hers in many languages, mine in the off color of my only tongue. Two bad dark languages rarely survive. is Hey Pretty by Poe. What you have been listening to was the voice of Mark Danielewski. Um, and what we're going to talk about, Mark, is form. Um, I was almost going to say that form is your middle name, um, but you already have a middle name, uh, which is shortened to a Z, and um, you don't want to tell us what the Z stands for, do you? No, <laughs> but for very specific reasons. Tell me the reasons. All right, so I, had this, I got this name that started with a Z, and it was, it was one of those strange little packs I made with myself, but I was around 10 or 12 years old, and I suddenly said to myself, you know what? I'm never going to tell my middle name except to the woman I marry. I'm not married yet, I haven't met that girl, but when that day comes, <laughs> then I will reveal my middle name. And it's a pact I've kept for now well, 30 years. Well, who knows what the audience will bring tonight. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> let's... If I get, get married tonight, we'll all find out. <laughs> um, let's talk about form. Um, as I said, you're in love with the, the way in which you can make literature speak. Um, let's begin in this novel with the use of different colors quotation marks. Mm -hmm. I was behind the screen, but I hope that everybody has seen the way in which the colors differed of the quotation marks. Could you tell us what you wanted to convey with that? Well, it's, 
for me, form is always, it's a technique which I can use to reveal something that I feel is, is particularly germane or even true to, uh, to a certain um, way of, of narrating events. And I think, I think convention allows us to just sort of plow ahead and, and, and tell a story. Uh, in fact, uh, stories are far more complex. They have a number of narrators uh, sort of entwined and nested within, uh, within the simplest framework. Um, certainly, that I think was visible as it becoming more and more clear to me in retrospect in House of Leaves. We have the specific narrator of Johnny Truant. We have a narrator uh, like Zampano. We have a, a narrator like uh, Pelafina. And, and with those narrators, narr narrators, we actually get a sense of their history and their biases and, uh, um, and whatnot. Um, in The Fifty Year Sword, we have five narrators, but they are only indicated by colored quotation marks. And those colors are certainly autumnal, which makes sense in terms of our Halloween story. But there's also something reminiscent, I might say, to various shades of skin color. Um, and I, what I think in some ways we have to realize that we, we may be a participant. We may be listening to a story. And we may see five people sort of in, entwining as they recall a certain event. And in, ef in, in effect, they are nothing more than colored quotation marks. You know, we may project upon them certain identities. We may make certain associations based, based on their ethnicity or, the t or even the languages they speak. However, those for the most part are probably false. In reality, we know very little about who those particular people um, are. So what I, wanted, what, I, what I wanted to do with the 50-year sword is, 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 tell, is, is bring forth a narrative that was, that was you know, hopefully compelling as a single piece, and yet at the same time visually re, you know, reference how complex its telling was, that there were many people involved in recounting this incident, that they must have seen it from many different angles, that they heard different things, that they may have invented different things. And that sort of just, it, it, it hints there, it's teasing us there, but it's also trying to create an awareness that whenever we hear a story, whenever we're listening to a specific narrative, there are many different voices percolating underneath the surface. But do you mind uh, when a reader doesn't take notice of these uh, quotation no. marks? No, I'm actually very proud that I think, I mean, one, one, one thing that seems to stick as far as the, uh, the type of stuff that I do is egalitarian fiction. And which is egalitarian it, fiction. Egalitarian fiction. It, it, it adjusts to your level of curiosity and your reading level. You know, if you there are there are young kids who've read House of Leaves in a weekend. Now, how do they do it? Well, they probably don't read everything. What they do is they they cleave to those intense moments, to the adventure story that runs throughout. Then there are then there are you know graduate students, professors who've spent months on that book, and obviously they've taken a much more serious look at what's going on and how it you know how it how it works through various themes. Certainly the case is here. You can read this aloud probably to some children. I had a friend who was reading it to uh, to her girlfriends, you know, and they were just you know, and they don't even read books, you know, they watch MTV and, and they were listening to the story and they wanted to know what happened once the you know the lid opened and you know, this strange box. Or you can start to say, you know what, I'm going to engage these quotation marks. I'm going to start to look at what's going on there. I'm going to look at how those colors, you know, change and, and what they signify, what they don't signify, what they suggest, what they can't ultimately definitively answer. And I'm going to try to answer for myself what that means. But that is, of course, only one of the things you use in, in the book. Another thing is, and audience has certainly seen that on screen, is um, the use of these illustrations that go with the book and white pages to sort of vary on the illustrations. These illustrations are by a Dutch artist. Yeah. Who is this Dutch artist and no, how do the illustrations come to the, in this book? Oh, well, that's, a, that's a great, great story. Uh, the, uh, the Busy Bee was actually, was the one that suggested that perhaps we move forward and find an, uh, an illustrator for, for the book. And um, 
And I was very open to that because I, I like the way it, it sort of, the, the story deals with adult themes uh, like delayed violence, uh, delayed gratification. Um, but as well, it is, a, it is told to five orphans, to five children. And, um, and I thought, well, this will be wonderful. Uh, but we looked at a bunch of illustrations. We just couldn't find the right ones. And, uh, and then it was this very weird coincidence that it happened right after House of Leaves came out. I, was, I, had, I had just been here, and I was in the airport. In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, waiting to go home. And I look over, and I see this very distinguished-looking gentleman with gray hair and gray beard, and he was a very attractive wife, and I think he was wearing this white linen suit, this maybe Panama hat, and these great sort of jangles around his neck and on his wrists. And, and I immediately recognized him. He was a man that I'd seen not blocks from where I live in Hollywood. And I had never said a word to him, and here I see the same figure and I approached him and I said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch. <laughs> and, and I said, and then he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm not Dutch, but I wrote a book that's translated into Dutch. And uh, so we started to talk and it turned out he was, uh, he was an artist. He lived uh, very close to me and um, painted incessantly, a passionate, really gifted man. And, uh, and that was that. We slowly became friends over the last four years. And as things start, didn't, you know, just didn't work out with the other illustrators we were looking at, I approached him. And I didn't approach him as an illustrator. I approached him as an artist. I said, Peter, I have this, I have this, um, I have this story, and I wonder if you might look at it. And if it inspires you, and if it's something that fits what you're doing, I would love to include your work in my book. Now, I was hoping that maybe we'd get three plates. And in fact, he produced a, just a beautiful series of these drawings, which are made with a, with, a, with a blue pencil, finely sharpened, and they're tiny little dots, little circles that he makes. And uh, it was really breathtaking, and it really, it really added to, to the book, and it provided thematically a lot of, about what I was getting for, because this sort of pointisma effect is about how there are little separate moments that are our eye actually forges and fuses together, One right? image. which is very much what the book is about, about how our narratives hold together many pieces, that, that the tension between what is cut up and what is, and what is stitched together. And how these five voices together make five. up one story. Exactly. Well, we have the, the, uh, the quotation marks and the voices, we have the illustrations, uh, then there, of course, are the words on the page. Um, People have seen that these are very small columns, mm -hmm. and if you if you are listening to you reading um, uh, the Fifty Year Sword, you think, well, this is is this prose or is this poetry? Mm -hmm. How how did you conceive of it? Do you think did you think, well, I'm going to write a long prose poem? Or we've wrestled with this one before, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, it's it really it. It's, it's very, it's dangerous to look at the book because in a weird way, the book immediately presents itself as form. It presents itself as something that has a narrow piece of text on the left side and a blank page on the right side. It has colored quotation marks. Um, it has, you know, these neologisms. It has, you know, a strange rhythm, even some internal rhymes. Uh, I don't start there. I start with a sword. You know, I start with the idea of just delayed hurt. When we've been, when someone has been at a party or at a dinner uh, gathering and heard a particular comment and walks away and suddenly two hours later she realizes that something really nasty had been said about her, you know, and she had laughed it off and, and now it's really cutting. Uh, from that suddenly comes the story about, well, okay, now where is the sword? Where does it show up? It, uh, 
it shows up in Texas. Well, Texas has a certain sort of twang to it, you know? And suddenly there are these characters, and I'm, well, how is it presented? Well, suddenly it's a, there's a storyteller, and the storyteller is telling it to five orphans, and how are they described, and where do they come from? And slowly all there's, there's all this energy, and these scenes come to life in my eyes, and I can see this ranch house, and I can see the way the children are running down the halls, and the way there's this seamstress that's enamored with them, and suddenly this strange figure arrives, and and he has this long box that's six feet long with angles of black. And, and then I begin to see how this is a story about those children, about those people. And they come with a certain music, you know, in their speech. And, and there's something about that sword, the way it's shaped, the way you can't see the blade, but the blade's effects are very real. And suddenly the text then begins to have that feel. And then I'm thinking, is the text really there or isn't it? And suddenly those voices come in. And do I want to break up each little line and tell who does it? And no. So how can I do that? Well, color looks is great because it economizes. You know, it's, it's the same thing with Johnny Truant in a way. Johnny Truant uses the courier font. Well, I could have indicated in some way every moment that this was Johnny Truant speaking, but instead it was easy. Suddenly you see Courier and you know it's Johnny Truant. So it's, it's a way of rapidly communicating information. But form anyway through that long history, bless you, is, you know, comes out at the very end. Um, these are all experiments with literature. Mm -hmm. uh, one could say, well, you want to tell a ghost story. Why not tell a ghost story simply like Stephen King style. Why do you need so many experiments? Um, what does it give to the story? Well, for me, I think it's just much more accurate about how stories are told, about how ghost stories are, are, are told. It just, it, 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 it rings with, with, with greater authenticity. Um, you know, for me, when I, I think an example might be in filmmaking. When you, see a, when you see a movie and there's someone walking down the street and it's, it's a high angle, the camera's high, and then the camera slowly lowers as the person walks towards the camera, and then maybe pans left as the person walks right. I immediately see that and go, oh, you know, it's a crane shot. It's, it's, there's a crew behind there. This is, a, this is an unmotivated camera. Maybe it's vaguely omniscient, but it's actually part of the conventions of Hollywood filmmaking, and it's just something we're supposed to you know, accept. When you look at masters of film, the, the camera is usually placed with a, there's a very, there's a, there's an economy and a psychology involved with how that, that is particularly directed. So a camera is aligned with a certain person's point of view. It trades off with another person's point of view. Or there's actually a psychology to, to how the camera moves. And it's not just a, it's not just a, a, sound, a, a sound crew and a, and, a, and a DP back there, but there's a whole series of, 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 of ideas that are contained there. So I think, I think you know, my, my desire is always to push that, that content as far as I can go to understand really what is behind a, um, a ghost story. Who are your, your influences um, in, in two ways? I mean, in, on the one hand, as an experimental writer, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, as a ghost story writer. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I, um, I, I wouldn't call myself an experimental writer. Okay, okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> I mean, I've, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm continuing an exploration which started 100 years ago with, with Joyce, with Apollinaire, with uh, Paul Van Ostein. Um, the Belgian writer? The Belgian writer. Have you read him? You no. Know. <laughs> I have not read him, but I have his books because I, I haven't been able to get a translation. So it's for me, it's, it's more visual. Or Mallarmé, you know. And certainly ghost stories in, in a much more American way. I think I'm very influenced in America in, in that respect. Uh, I mean, I look at Hawthorne and Emily Dickinson and... Uh, um, Emily Dickinson? Oh, she's a great a strange gothic writer. Very scary, very scary woman. She's not a, a writer whose who's, you know, verses belong in Hallmark cards, that they are, you know, there's, there's a darkness in, 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 in what she writes. And, and, and a wonderful poet to reintroduce yourself to if you haven't read in a while. You have to look at her as a real Gothic writer. Uh, Melville as well. As well. As well. Um, you have not mentioned Edgar Allan Poe. Whom Edgar I, Allan Poe, I know. Was mentioning. Yes, absolutely, Edgar Allan Poe. Because some of the doubt. rhythms in the Fifty Year Sword are reminiscent, reminiscent of the rhythms in, uh, well, the famous poem, The Raven, yeah. where you have all these internal rhymes and these, this sort of flow of words in a ghost story. 
Yeah, I think you're right. And maybe I didn't mention it because there was a little unease, a little anxiety there. I don't know, possibly. <laughs> the anxiety of influence. Yeah, exactly. Um, talking about those ghost stories, um, why are you so fascinated by ghost stories? I mean, House of Leaves was a lot of things. Um, I mentioned a few aspects of the novel. It, ha it has many aspects. But one of the aspects is certainly a ghost story, the story about the haunted house. This is a ghost story. Um, what makes ghost stories interesting for you? More interesting than other genres? Well, it's, imp it's important to, to note that actually there, there is no ghost in House of Leaves, technically, and there is no ghost in the 50-year sword. So I don't want to disappoint anyone if anyone wants to read it and go, well, where, where's, where's the goddamn ghost? <laughs> where's the white cloak? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but certainly that, that notion of, of the Gothic uh, is not something I entirely understand. It's something I inherited, I suppose. I think it's a, there's a cultural legacy there. There is, there is something just about that world that is very interesting and intriguing to me. And I think, I mean, I'm the kind of person who doesn't want to look in the closet and yet definitely goes and looks in the closet or doesn't want to go into the basement or doesn't want to ask that question because it's scary, but I'm going to ask that question anyway. I mean, that's kind of who I am. And I think, you know, I, I do think that there's an importance here, which I am constantly toying with, that, 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 that curiosity is something that's very... Um, it's morally significant even. And so that if I can, and, and I think ghost stories are always about mystery. They're always about death. They're always about what is beyond us, what is outside of us. And I think it's, it's a much, you, we live in a much better world if, if we're constantly asking those questions, if we're constantly curious about the world around us, even the world that scares us. So we're, curious about spiders instead of just going out and killing them, you know, because we know nothing of them. And as soon as you, if you accept that, and if you accept that maybe writing a story that makes you curious about a sword, about a house, whatever, but that it suddenly can, it suddenly sort of stokes those fires and then you move forth and maybe you're a little more curious about someone else, you know, and you're maybe a little more curious about a, a politician and what they're doing. And, and you've even faced your fear a little and you've gotten through it. So now you maybe have a little bit more courage to ask that question or to confront that politician. Um, so it reaches parts of the readers other genres can't reach. Yeah, I think so. And this is early in my career. I mean, who knows? We'll see where we go. <laughs> who knows what other? I mean, in the end, we will probably say, well, you read 69 books and only two of them were ghost, were ghost stories. stories. <laughs> right. um, but is it a coincidence because on my copy of, of House of Leaves, there is a blurb by Brett Easton Ellis. Um, and oh. Brett Easton Ellis, as you probably know, has just published a new novel. Lunar, Lunar Park, Lunar yeah. Park, which takes place, I mean, which begins at a Halloween party, actually. This novel of yours takes place at a Halloween party, and that's it. But his goes on after Halloween. Um, are you, in, were you in, in any way connected with each other in writing these, these, these books? I'd never met Brett before uh, he'd written the, the blurb. I'd certainly read his stuff. He was a celebrity in, you know, in the US with less than zero American mm -hmm. Psycho. And out of the blue, I got this incredible blurb. And it was also, it was also written on the manuscript. It was not, it was not written uh, with, uh, in response to a galley or a bound galley from the, from the publisher. You must know it by head. Tell us the brew. I don't, actually. I don't, you don't know by heart. All I know is there's a lot of kneeling and bowing, and it makes me very nervous. <laughs> um, and I know David Foster Wallace, and I get always a little sheepish when I think about that quote, because he's bowing to me as well. Um, but it, it, it's, it was... It, it was a wonderful thing because you know people are very afraid of dealing with manuscripts. You know, there's there's an there's something that when there, there's the imprimatur of a of a publisher, you know, behind it, you really sort of it's easier to get excited because you know there's a whole force of pe of people moving something through. But he wrote this based on just you know manuscript pages, so it was very generous of him. And I told him he's you know whenever he wants dinner, he's got it on me for the rest of my life because it really he was it, great. <laughs> But since then, we actually do enjoy a bit of fine dining. So when he's in L.A., we go out for a nice restaurant. We catch up on, on literary things. Uh, 
And I think we, you know, we both have an appetite for, um, besides good food, for, for good movies and... Uh, and for Halloween. And for Halloween. So that's all I can say. You know, I don't discuss with him what I'm writing now. You know, he doesn't discuss with me what he's writing. Do, you know, have I influenced him some way or has he influenced me or whatever? I leave that up to you. Okay, that's for the critics. Um, let's talk about film a little bit because you, you were mentioning film and, well, the directors who go for the production value and the directors who go for content. Um, uh, House on Leaves, you could say, was a kind of film in words for part of it. Um, you had the cross-cutting, you had the multiple perspective, you had acceleration, uh, slowing down by means of the typography. Um, I said that you are the son of a uh, director. Mm -hmm. um, what is your relationship with film besides that? I mean, you have a very direct relationship with film because you're the son of a director. But sure. Well, I was raised on film and books. I mean, we watched films every day, I mean, every week, sometimes every day. In what our, kind of films basement. did your father make? Everything. Uh, oh, my father make. He made uh, avant-garde films, documentary films. He tr even tried to make a, a showbiz sort of Hollywood film. He was, he was constantly experimenting, you know, with uh, different genres, I suppose. Um, experimenting. <laughs> he was an uh, experimental director. Experimental. But he would bring back all sorts of films, all the classics, John Ford, Orson Welles, Kubrick, you know, rotten stuff to good stuff. And, uh, and we, would, we, we would not only watch these movies, but we would analyze them between real changes. This was 16 millimeter film, you know, on these old uh, projectors. And there would be a great deal of discussion on elements that really are not well known or even discussed today about how the eye moves and how it creates a certain amount of energy by the way uh, focal points are placed on the screen. You know, there's, you know, basic things like, if you, you, know, uh, you know, one interesting thing to keep an eye out on is like, for instance, in, at the end of a romance where generally one person is running to the other person, okay, whether it's the girl running to catch the guy or the guy running to, the, to catch the girl, watch which way they're running. Very important. If they're running from left to right or right to left, it has a totally different feeling. We're in a culture where people read from left to right, so it moves much more quickly if they're if they're running from left to right. But if they're running from right to left, we sense a kind of resistance. We sense that they're 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 slowing down. So if we want if we want to make the person we, if we want the audience to feel like they're they're not going to make it. Then let's have them running right to left. If we feel like, okay, it's getting closer, it's getting closer, then shift it from left to right. So these are important things that people never really notice. They don't talk about. Incredible, you know. How does that translate to literature? Well, in House of Leaves, it was very specific uh, all over the place. It's how you moved, moved your eye. Uh, example would be chapter nine is the labyrinth chapter, which is... Uh, which is very complex, but it slows you down. That's the ultimate point. It takes a while to read those 40, 50 some pages or 30, I don't know what it is. But the next chapter is the rescue chapter where there's only a few sentences per page. Suddenly you read 100, 130 pages in a matter of minutes. And already you're being viscerally moved by how you move through the book. And this comes from a love of books. I think there's a great deal mm -hmm. of potential in books that you don't see on a screen. Now, I'm all in favor of a paperless world, according to, to Bill Gates, on some levels. But at the same time, there's a lot that this wonderful, you know, three-dimensional object has, the way we can move it around. It, it, it has a lot more possibilities than I think have been explored thus far. And if books continue just to be narratives that are flowed onto the page on a two-dimensional surface, then we might as well read them on the screen. And I think some novels... We should, it would be great, there's no problem. But does that mean that this pr particular form is dead? I don't feel that it is yet. Um, but I mean, even like there, there are filmic techniques here going on, which is, uh, you know, take an example here. This, you know, obviously we have the sword and we have, we have pages here, like we're all, we're the page, the text is running down the, down the, down the left side here, okay? And then it's, it's open here. All right, now again, we're used to reading from left to right, all right? Now, there are many ways you could have designed this particular page. You could have put this page, you could have put this text here, right? But then we would have actually lost the space here. You wouldn't have become aware of it. It would have been far more claustrophobic. It would have cut you off at the edge here because your eye would have leapt here 
and then it would have stayed here. And it really wouldn't have wandered here. Whereas here, your eye kind of loosely moves here, and it's constantly being drawn into a space out here. And this opens up the story. It allows, it sort of invites the reader in a way, you know, in an ocular, with an ocular sensation to examine what's here. And it even then periodically re rewards the, the reader with an image. So sometimes you'll move and you go, oh, there's an image there. So you know something could be there, right? And then the next page, it's not. But you keep kind of looking there and you keep kind of trying to find out what's here. And you know, my, my, my contention is that you will start to see things there. You will start to, you know, imagine your own, imagine your own thing. And again, it's thematically related because it's a sword blade that we know is there, but a sword blade that we can't see. You know, and so all these themes start to function. And for me, it's, you know, I was, I, I've often been toyed because it took me a long, it took me a while to write this. It took me like a year and a half to really finish that, this book. And um, in the midst of working on this much larger project, which has caused this bump on my head, if you can notice it from there, which is its own story. Um, but I, was, I, I used to also think that I'm sort of like, I think I probably would have made a great watchmaker because I'm always constantly like, you know, I, I, I tinker with words and I find out like a certain word like butterfly has a specific meaning, you know. Butterfly in English is to, is to, to cut open something. You can butterfly a steak, you can butterfly a chicken breast and it means you open it up. Or you can butterfly a wound, which means that you can actually, you know, it's a, it's a type of bandage which will, which will bring together, uh, you know, a, a wound. So it's, value it's yeah, so the, so the word is actually that which is cuts apart and the way, that which holds something together, which is one of the, you know, important themes. But then I realized, you know, I'm not really a watchmaker because it's, it's with, despite all these details, my, my works don't really tell something. They're not about just telling the time. That sort of would be like a, like a Stephen King story. It, it tells you a horror tale. And I realize I think more and more, I feel like I'm, at least this is where I am today, I'm more of an instrument maker. I make, I'm, I make a violin and, and it still needs to be played. And so I create spaces. And the reader is the player. Exactly, for the reader to participate, to, to, to yeah, so there's an exchange, a playfulness between what I'm doing and what has yet to be written in the reader's mind, you know. We wandered from film, um, and, and I want to go back to that, because we are going to watch two videos you shot for your sister to promote the songs of your sister, Poe. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about these two videos? Um, in what, Why did you make them the way you make them? And in what way do they differ from each other? Sure. Uh, well, they were, they were labors of love, and they were done for my sister. Uh, they started on the tour in 97, uh, which was the second time I'd actually come to Amsterdam. And you'll see a, a few shots from Amsterdam in the first video, Angry Johnny. And then you'll see almost the entire uh, video for that day was shot uh, in Amsterdam at the American Hotel. Um, we were incredibly limited financially. I had a hand crank Bolex 16 millimeter. There was no sound. I was literally, excuse me, I was, I was literally cranking, cranking this camera, shooting for about 20 seconds, and then, you know, winding it up again. Um, but I used different types of film, black and white, some color, saturated, and, you know, desaturated, um, some of the stuff chemically. Uh, and I think, it, you know, it was, it was a tricky process because I didn't, again, I didn't know exactly what the narrative was going to be, you know, and it evolved over the course of being on tour with her for a couple of months. Um, but the advantage is, is that my sister and I are very close and you'll see moments here. This actually has not been shown that often um, and I'm extremely proud of it and extremely proud of her. Uh, the song Angry Johnny was a huge hit. That day is a very, it's a, it's a gem which a lot of her fans know very well. Does it have um, to do with House of Leaves? In, uh, well, because it, we have a Johnny in House of Leaves. Yes, it does. Angry Johnny is absolutely related to Johnny Truant. Uh, I mean, this is, I don't, this is a very well-known story, but my sister and I influence each other uh, a great deal. So I will listen to her songs while I'm writing, and her music and her lyrics you know, affect me enormously. And then she will read things that I'm writing and literally take lines and, and use them in her songs. And it just goes back and forth. It's, it's like one of those Escher drawings of the two hands drawing each other. And certainly, you know, there was a, this is, this is in 97, so I had been working on House of Leaves, but 
now I had an opportunity to actually apply what I knew about film, filmically, you know, and you carry out some of the various things I was telling, you know, I was describing for you just moments ago about how the page works. The first one is, is structured a little, if you'll forgive me, on, on uh, Lenny Reifenstahl's Power of the Will, but it kind of, um, will to power, excuse me, power of the will, okay. uh, will to power, but it, 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 it's changed a little. I mean, I think you could say there's even a, twi <laughs> yeah, there's a twist at the end about what happens, but it, it, it's, very, it's, very, uh, it's very finely structured again. It took a long time, and you'll never, you won't see a video like this because it represents months and months of work. Mostly videos are shot in three days. They're two setups. They do it quickly. They add a lot of color. This is, this is hundreds of different clubs and tiny little bits that you'll see that just sort of create a whole sense of where she's coming from. But I want you to watch how it starts where she's way up in the clouds. We start in it with an airplane. And then how all the shots are limited mostly to the characters in the band without instruments. And then slowly we see them with their instruments. We see the music, but we still don't see the crowd. And then slowly we begin to see the crowd. And then slowly the plane begins to, to land. And slowly a tension is established between my sister and the band and her relationship to the crowd. And I won't tell you, I won't tell you the ending, but that's the first one. And the second one was much more a set piece and it, it was a lot about, um, uh, contrasts. You'll see that she was in a highly saturated red coat on the top of a balcony. She's right, she, the song is about a past memory that she had of a very bad day. You see the peaceful canal below, but then it's intercut with a very blue and dangerous river image of Niagara Falls, which was America. So, you know, two very extreme differences, one very placid, one that's roaring towards this, you know, this brutal conclusion, if you will. And, um, and then there's a sort of a little poetic ending as well. Okay, we're going to watch them, and after that there will be time for questions from the audience. So you can, while watching, think of your uh, questions. My little sister. She's pretty talented, huh? She is. Could you tell us um, why is she called Poe? Oh, she was. Why does uh, she call herself Poe? I must say. Uh, well, Danielewski wouldn't fit on the CD cover. Um, <laughs> she's, uh, she, it was, she was around, it was she, 10 years old, 11 years old, about the time I was making the pact about my middle name. She went to a, uh, a Halloween party dressed as the Red Plague. Again, a Halloween was, party. Exactly, because she'd, um, uh, she'd seen the Vincent Price version of the uh, Edgar Allan Poe story. And uh, the next day, one of the, uh, the mothers called my mom and said, so how's little Poe doing? And that pretty much stayed as a nickname on and off. And, uh, and finally, when she really started making mu uh, music seriously, it, it, it stuck, and that was it. And she, she was influenced by the fact that she saw a movie, not read the stories or heard the stories by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I mean, it is not that in your family, Edgar Allan Poe was read every day, like... Oh yeah, for, Dutch for breakfast. Did yeah, yeah, no, my, mean, my, my father would, would cut out the pages and tape it to the cereal boxes. And okay. That's what, we would yeah, say well, that. we would that's what they used to do in Holland with the Bible, so you it's know, not it, that strange. It's a mix, you know, There's, it's, it's movies. It's not television, it's movies and books, you know, and uh, we had an appetite for both, and we saw both of them as related. I mean, obviously there is some tension here between, you know, uh, movies and books and what c books can do and what movies can do. And, uh, but it was from a movie. And she actually didn't even know who Poe was, I think, at that moment. It was, uh, it was uh, Vincent Price who did it for her. And it stuck to her. It stuck, yeah. Um, it's difficult for me to see in the audience, um, but is there anybody who has a question? Yeah, there is a, there is a mic in front, and uh, you could also stand up and, and shout it aloud. Sorry, could you repeat that? We didn't hear. Ah, she's working on that. Sorry, right now. what's the, your sister's answer to the 50, 50 years, years sword? sword. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, she's working on that right now. Um, so we'll see. Uh, she's she's finishing her her third album. She's quite a few songs, 
and uh, you know, if all goes well, you'll be able to hear it uh, probably next summer. I think. Is it a sort of? I mean, I'd sing it for you, but you don't want that. <laughs> no, we, thank you. Um, <laughs> Is it a kind of call and response relationship you and your sister have? I mean, in the way that you answer to each other's artistic products? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. It's certainly a, a form that works very well. And I would, I would, I would counsel others who have close friends uh, who you work creatively with. We don't criticize each other. Isn't that bad? No, because what we do is we comment on what we like. Mm -hmm. Ooh. The Halloween party is really Halloween. kicking in now. Things are not as they should be. <laughs> Things are falling. Yeah, don't, yeah, don't speak while I'm talking, all right? <laughs> um, uh, so it's no, but we don't generalize. Mm -hmm. It's not, oh, that's so great. It's we focus on what we really like. So it becomes specific about, so for me, it's what she hears. Oh, she hears that, but she didn't hear something else. And mm -hmm. I can see it very quickly. I can read it in her eyes. I can read the way she's, she's dealing with something. And the same with me. It's like, I will focus on what I like. And I'm like, that's really great. So it's not like, well, is that working? Or does that work? Or, you know, this doesn't work. Immediately she knows, okay, the verse is probably not working, but the bridge seems to really have connected or vice versa. So. If uh, it's the particulars of what she likes, I trust her ear. She has, a, she has a formidable ear. I mean, it's pitch perfect. So certainly the music, getting back to your poetry question, is influenced a lot by, by that, by, that, by our own interest in tonalities and sounds and the importance uh, of that and how meaning can be uh, conveyed you know, through sound as well as image. Is there another question? Yes, I see a hand. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there is a longer list. I was giving sort of a brief list. E.E. E. Cummings is, uh, is, is, is great, was an early influence, certainly read, you know, quite a bit uh, of him even before high school. Uh, Absolutely, yes, definitely. She being brand new and consequently a little stiff and all that, yes. He's probably not as well known in Holland as he should be, of course, but also not as well known in Holland as he is in America. Could you tell us a little bit about... Well, E.E. E. Cummings e. certainly Cummings. struck every adolescent with the fact that he didn't capitalize things, and that was just cool. Like, he came along and said, well, I'm not going to capitalize anything. So he, he came out and he suddenly said, look, this is the way I'm, I'm going to write, and it's going to be different from all the rule books, and that was immediately intriguing. And then there was all play with punctuation. It was how lines broke, how there could be a sentence that that would read normally. It could be, it would, it would read as, 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 you know, quotidian, if you will. But the way he broke it up on the page suddenly reinformed it with a whole different um, sense of what those words were about. And, uh, and, and also he was, he was far more minimal than say, you know, the more expansive techniques of, uh, of, um, of Joyce. But he was not the sort of writer who would make a poem about a guitar in the form of a guitar? No, not, no, it was his own form. And I mean, whether he, whether he experimented with that, I'm, I'm not aware of, but. Um, in the form of a mouse, yes. Okay, there, there you have go. it. That's right. But the, I, I, but the, but the majority of the poems were, were, were not as, as specific as that, because there's something reductive about that as well. And mm -hmm. so I'm glad he steered away from that. Okay. <laughs> Another hand, perhaps. Yeah, there in the third row. Uh, authors like Paul Auster and John Jacob Powell have written books about the events that were in 9 11. Do you feel called upon to comment on events like that? Um, Did everybody hear the question? The question was uh, authors had written about 9 11. Do I feel called upon to write about something like that? Uh, yes. Um, but I'm. But how I go about that is 
sort of my own path. Uh, I mean, I think one thing that, that should be added in, is that I've been working for six years on a book that's going to be coming out in fall of 2006. And it's much bigger and more complicated than House of Leaves or The Fifty Year Sword. And it has taken all my time and all my energy and all my life. And it has wrecked many things in my life. Uh, <laughs> if it's influenced by 9-11, which I think in some ways it is and in some ways it's not, certainly that's the place to look. Fifty Year Sword was written initially two years ago in the course of a week around Halloween. And then I went back to working on that, which is the working title for my, this next book that's coming out. So, I, it's, so my friends could know what I was doing and it's, they could say I like that better than House of Leaves or, or I, I didn't like that very much or I could say that's that and how's that and it's like that and you don't know that's what it is and things like, and it just goes on like that, but like that. <laughs> So that's how I, that's how I would, that's how, I, so I was, you know, working intensely on this. And then I would come back and I'd start to play again with, with Fifty Year Sword. So Fifty Year Sword really, as far as, as the, as the writing goes, bore nor, none of the burdens of, of 9-11, um, of, you know, the success of House of Leaves, um, or whatnot. I do have to say, though, that just from my perspective, I had a very, different view of 9-11. I was very disturbed by it. I was upset by it. My sister was actually in New York at the time. Um, but you have to understand, we were raised by a father who had been in the Warsaw insurrection, and he had seen an entire city leveled, and 200,000 people killed, and he survived and was placed in a camp. And we used to be sitting at the breakfast table or the dinner table, and our elbows would find their way to the table. And he would look at us and he'd say, bombs are falling, elbows off the table. And we thought he was crazy. Because <laughs> we'd look around and we'd go, there are no bombs. And, he's, and we said, well, what does that mean? And he said that this was a phrase that he'd learned actually in England during the um, bombing raids. Uh, and it certainly was something that he apparently was aware of, or he said he was aware of in, in the Warsaw Insurrection that despite the fact that entire buildings were falling, one still regarded one's manners very carefully. So that is not, that doesn't offer any opinion on 9-11, but it, it should give you an idea about where I come from and how I was affected by, you know, a difference certainly in, you know, the numeric quantities, which is a horrible way of looking at life, but it is part of the, the equation, if you will. Um, and so certainly I wrestle with that, but I wrestle with, uh, you know, I happen to know a bit about Vietnam, and I know that 50,000 Americans died, and I know that, you know, excess of millions of Vietnamese died, and I know it's, you know, it's the same thing is happening in Iraq, and things are going unreported, and, you know, and, and numbers lie, and zeros lie, and, and, and all of that. So uh, I think those things will probably find their way more visibly in, the, um, in that, but i have to wait until October of 06 to see what that's all about. <laughs> then our lives will be wrecked, like yours was in writing. <laughs> oh, I hope not. I really, no, I don't, I don't think it should be wrecked. I, it's not. But we better reserve some time. Yeah. I mean, this bump is from it. I grew. I, I went to the doctor, and, um, and they, they took an MRI of it. And uh, the doctor came out and said, uh, well, it's an osteoma on the frontal plate above the such and such a lobe. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And she looked at me and said, you're a unicorn. <laughs> I was like, what? She said, it's a horn. It is literally a horn that's growing out of my head right now. So, and will you get another? Maybe on the next book. You know? <laughs> we'll find. I'm an off-center unicorn, or I'm going to be a little Diablo, or a Hellboy, or I don't know. <laughs> um, another question. In the back of the... Ah, very well. You're walking up to the front microphone. Um, I just started uh, House of Leaves, in fact, and the copy I have is in black and white. And I noticed in the front matter that you, well, or someone has put the information stating, well, uh, I think it's house should be... Certain words should be colorized. Mm -hmm. 
and in my edition they're not. So I'm wondering, did you intend different meanings for the different editions of the book? Mm -hmm. In terms of, obviously, if, uh, like you said with the, with the 50 year sword, if you've got five different narrators with different colored quotation marks, do you then have a different uh, intention for people to read? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, so, so could you kind of explain the layers? Because, I mean, do, do I need to read House of Leaves in three editions in order? Well, I'm not, not that I would, but I'm just and saying. buy them all multiple right, times. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So just. No, know, no. I mean, I mean there's, there's a lot about the colors and the significance of the colors on a lot of the websites and the houseofleaves.com board and, uh, it, you know, it's a good place to go, and I, I don't really comment on that because I don't want to limit it. But I will say there was a careful amount of thought that went into, you know, every page of that layout. In fact, I used to joke. I was joking today with, uh, with with my publishers that um, if I could, I would have a say about what number was used on the barcode on the book. Yeah. So, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> so, but it's a it's a fair question and. Uh, you know, there were a bunch of editions. There was a black and white, which was issued in, in England. Then there was the, uh, the blue edition, which was where the house was only in blue uh, in, um, in the US. There was also a red edition, where house was gray and other sections were blue. There's supposed to be eventually a purple edition, where actually only one phrase appears in purple, and, and the red passages appear in gray, and the, and the house, and house appears in gray. And finally, there is supposed to be eventually a color, full color edition where the color plates will be visible, house will be in blue, certain sections involving the minotaur will be in red, that phrase will be in purple, and uh, the it, heavens will open up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I wonder. Does it make a difference? Does it, I, frankly speaking, I thought it was a budget, a matter of budget. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I also have a black and white edition. That's probably because I couldn't afford the colored one. No. Um, but does no, it does so. it give you another book if you have other colors on the page? And in what way would that work? I don't think that's my job to decide. Actually, I, I think it does. But I think it's 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 your job to tell if if there is a difference. I think people do notice. I think when you see blue, blue has very specific meanings and very non-specific meanings. But it creates a certain sense. We have, there's a lot of idea, especially in the filmic world, what blue means. If you see gray, there is information that's missing. You know, there is information that's being told to you throughout the book that you may not be conscious of. Perfect example, Johnny frequently uses the phrase, out of the blue, okay? It's a, it's a casual remark. It's a very specific remark, though, in context to the meaning of the color blue that's slowly being established through the course of the book. So when you see that house and you see blue, you understand, your mind understands that it's blue. And every time you hear that word blue, suddenly that moment, that moment might get accented a bit more. And that creates a certain register of meaning, a certain emotional response. Okay. So there's nothing to it than buy all the editions to get that at least one of them. Well, if you can get first things. editions, I think you'll probably do well, actually. <laughs> they tend to do well at that level. Okay. But go to the library, read it however you want. I don't care. <laughs> yes? Yeah, of course. I love the Apollinaire. Apollinaire. The, you, you mentioned the, the title, The didn't Calligrams. You? Um, specifically, I can't say. I just know that when I was living in Paris, I was reading Apollinaire and Mallarmé, and you know, it was a way of studying French and trying to woo a girl that would have nothing to do with me. So, there we go. Sous le pont Mirabeau, Coulassin, and you know, all, all of Apollinaire was great. To a counterculture? I don't, no, I don't care about it. Question anything. is whether <laughs> The writer has Do I have a responsibility to the counterculture? You know, I, I don't. I don't have. I don't feel. I, I'm not connected to any kind of movement. I, in fact, I really. I don't care much for even the idea of countries or, or or languages or ethnic boundaries, and certainly not small cultures. I just. I feel that we invent divisions constantly, and it's. I. I'm, I think it holds people back more. I mean, I. I certainly have, have noticed that that people who read my book and are fascinated by it or challenged by it seem to fall just across generations, across 
cultural lines, ethnic lines, and what I see in them is, is a great deal of curiosity, a, 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 fer, a, fer, a, fer, a ferocity towards ideas, and um, so to have these vague sort of nomenclatures about movements and whatnot just really doesn't interest me. I mean, I, I, I find I'm just much more particular about people, specific relationships, um, and, and that, that seems to serve me well. So you're not very happy to be called a cult writer? No, I don't care what you call me. I've been called all sorts of things. <laughs> but I'm not going to take you very seriously. <laughs> OK. We're warned. One question there. You can have three. Could, could, you, <laughs> could you walk up to the, phone, to the microphone, please? Especially since it's going to be two questions. Or three. Or oh, three. Oh, that's three. Yeah. Uh, She's been enthusiastically poking her head out of the eyes. <laughs> I think it, does it tilt? Just lean it down like Mick Jagger does. <laughs> Swing it round. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned about uh, supposedly sometime maybe the other editions of the House of Leeds? Yes. Was that a possibility? Well, I, I just I can't be definite about the date, but I, it will definitely happen. Eventually, really? we will do a full color. It may take 10 years. You remember you're talking to a guy who takes a long time, so supposedly it could mean 20 years from now or 30, but it will happen. So wow. yes, there will be a full color edition. Full color. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. It may be big. I don't know. There are all sorts of ideas. With, we may the, take the, with the Braille and the... With the Braille, we may even take the, the, the HOL board and put, like, comments <laughs> on the outside and add other things. You know, we may make a whole project out of it. So it's possible. Supposedly. Maybe. Kind of. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and something that's always uh, fascinated me, why Dutch, out of all the different languages that you could have chosen this French and Japanese also, but Dutch So here we get back to this gentleman's question, right? Which is, well, do I feel a responsibility to the counterculture? No, no. not at all. Well, no, 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 no. no but no. let me finish because oh. it's, it answers yeah. that. I don't really believe in the Dutch. I don't believe in Holland. I don't even believe in another continent. I don't even believe in a publishing house like the Busy Bee. Sounds like a John Lennon lyric. But the fact is, I do believe in Francine and Robert at De BGB because they're the ones I have a relationship with and they are great and they call me when there's nothing happening and they send me an email or we go and have a coffee whenever I'm in Amsterdam and there's a real specific relationship there between these two remarkable people and it's those people that have brought this book here and then afterwards, well, well, might as well translate into Dutch because that's our first language here. And you know, well, this publishing house, Busy Bee, can do it, et cetera, et cetera. So it really doesn't. It does it, again. It doesn't develop out of a out of a thought for a certain country or a certain language, but out of a certain relationship that I have. So that relationship was there uh, when you came to publish the House of Leeds. No, it kind of developed. They they found it and 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 did it and. Uh, a wonderful editor named uh, Jasper Henderson was the one who was involved in that. And so that sort of brought me over. And then by then, I met Francine and Robert. And, and we connected. And we connected beyond the boundaries of just selling this book. Um, and they were very gracious. They had great manners. The elbows were off the table. They invited me. They thanked me. They gave me chocolates. The Japanese produced a wonderful edition. They never invited me over. I never talked to the translator. They didn't give you sushi? No, I wanted sushi, though. I did. I would have hoard myself out for sushi, no. <laughs> but no, they, there was just no, it just didn't happen that way. So you know? it, it, uh, the Dutch edition of the House of Leaves came out, came about through personal relationships. Yeah, right? Exactly, and France nice. as well. It was a particular translator named Claro who discovered the book, you know, fell in love with all its puns and its structures and did a remarkable job translating the book. And then of course it became the French edition, but it really wasn't. It's, it's Claro's edition, as far as I know. And then more people involved. And I could go through the list of all those names. It, it's very specific. It's like the quotation marks. I don't think of just one blank story that has the moniker of Coca-Cola or Chevron. You know, I think of Claro and Swazik and Eloise and, and, uh, and, and Natalie and a whole bunch of people. So. 
There you go. Okay. Does that to? answer the question? Yes, yes it does. <laughs> and now you're going to go for your <laughs> third may, one? May right, go for and that will be the last yes. question right. of tonight. It, <laughs> well, it's specifically related to the 50-year sword. Okay. Um, I don't know if I should be seeing some... Well, should see something here, but when... Should's a very maybe, Republican yeah. word. <laughs> uh, I love the voices, and the, the denoted by the different colours. And sometimes I would see a quotation mark of one colour directly followed by a single quotation mark of another colour. And I'm a little confused Ooh. over... It. Yeah, exactly. What, what's going on there? Oh, you like I forgot? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. And you knew that. It was yeah. a bold third yeah. question, but I'm not going <laughs> to tell you why the color blue, and I'm not going to tell you why I did that. But I look forward to reading the discussions. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was a good try. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, and I give the floor over to Monique of the John Adams Institute. I will be very brief, but I think there will be first a hand for both of you. Thanks, Mark, for telling. <laughs> Coming on this Halloween, Halloween night, which is a special night for you, as we know, to Amsterdam, bringing your book, which is beautifully made. And I'm sorry, Peter, that we didn't have that thing on the screen. You oh, thought you it was, yeah, but we couldn't make it I couldn't see through the screen, could I? <laughs> so, but there will be a chance for you to see the book and actually to have it signed by Mark. There will be uh, books for sale here. And um, I invite you to, uh, to see the book soon. Thank you, uh, Mark, again, to come all the way from uh, LA to John Adams Institute here. Thank you, Peter, for, uh, you know, I know you're a very busy man these days, but uh, you're a familiar face to the John Adams Institute. I'm very happy with your help. You did a wonderful introduction, and I think it um, went very nice the way you talked to each other. Even you talked already yesterday. I mean, we can reveal a secret now. You had another program in Rotterdam, but it sounds still very new and experimental today. Thank you also, um, Kobe, for making all the things on the screen, which is very new for us for the John Adams Institute, because normally we have only lectures and um, people talking without projections. You mean no pumpkin? No pumpkin. <laughs> we have flowers there normally. <laughs> Wednesday night already, on the 2nd of November, I believe, we have Brian Green in our program. Something Great guy. totally different. The book's called The Fabric of the Cosmos, so it's different. Different stuff. <laughs> uh, that's on Wednesday night. There's still tickets available, I believe. You can see our website, um, johnadams.nl, with a dash between the John and the Adams, and you'll find it. Thank you all again for all for coming tonight, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>